Good evening, I'm Derek Broman and I'm the Game Program Manager for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you very much for tuning in on our fifth and final webinar regarding the latest draft chapters of the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan update. These latest chapters cover topics related to anthropogenic impacts, poaching, and monitoring of mule deer in Oregon. Just like you, we here at ODFW are extremely passionate about mule deer. This plan update is an all hands on deck approach for the agency and the content shared to date is the collaborative product of numerous wildlife biologists, wildlife researchers, and other subject matter experts with combined decades of experience and in ongoing innovative research. For tonight's topics, co-authors for the draft chapters include professionals who specialize in habitat mitigation and management, wildlife and deer management, and law enforcement and anti-poaching campaigns. ODFW will continue to pull in experts to help in our goal of updating the mule deer plan. With that, let's get started with tonight's webinar. As stated earlier, we will be discussing three chapters, anthropogenic impacts, poaching, and mule deer monitoring. We will start off with staff presentations, and then finish with a live Q&A session. Like past webinars, we will be receiving questions live, but please recognize we may not get to all of the questions received, and you're welcome to submit questions afterwards as well. All questions can be submitted using the link in the YouTube video description below, the QR code, or on a, our Mule Deer Plan webpage. Starting off tonight is a pre-recorded presentation from Joy Lovett, the ODFW Land Use and Waterway Alterations Coordinator, and Jeremy Thompson, the ODFW Energy Program Coordinator. Following the recording, all of our speakers will be part of the live Q&A and are always available for follow-up conversations via email or a phone call. So, Joy, if you would, please proceed with your presentation. Hello, I'm Joy Lovett, ODFW Land Use Coordinator and Habitat Division, and with me is Jeremy Thompson, ODFW Energy Program Coordinator. Today, we will be providing a brief overview of Chapter 10 of the Mule Deer Management Plan, which focuses on anthropogenic impacts. This chapter briefly highlights some of the most significant issues currently impacting mule deer and provides some strategies and recommendations to address them. Information is focused on public and private land management, impacts from recreation and road development, renewable energy development, rural development and urban growth, and land use changes resulting from local land use decisions. This chapter also supports other mule deer management plan chapters, such as chapter four, migration movements and habitat connectivity, chapter five, economic and social values of Oregon mule deer, and chapter six, nutrition and habitat. While ODFW was charged with the protection and enhancement of wildlife species such as mule deer, ODFW has limited direct management authority over the habitat which mule deer depend. Therefore, ODFW relies on partnerships with private landowners, state and federal land management agencies, and tribal partners to collaborate on measures to protect and manage sensitive life history stages of mule deer. Mule deer are a surrogate for many wildlife species, and mule deer habitat overlaps with other habitats of concern such as those identified in the Oregon Conservation Strategy and Priority Wildlife Connectivity Areas. Mule deer can be the beneficiary of habitat protections from other species, such as greater sage grouse. In addition, the Oregon Conservation Strategy identifies land use changes and barriers to animal movement as key conservation issues, which also helps to address the issues affecting mule deer. This map is just an example to highlight the overlap of Eastern Oregon deer winter range and other conservation priorities such as Oregon Conservation Opportunity Areas identified in the Oregon Conservation Strategy, Priority Wildlife Connectivity Areas, and Greater Sagegrass Habitat. Chapter 10 highlights six significant issues affecting mule deer and their habitat. Oregon has a comprehensive land use planning program, which includes 19 statewide planning goals. ODFW relies on local and state compliance with the land use planning program and primarily coordinates with local governments regarding Goal 5. Goal five is the planning goal related to natural resources, which includes mule deer winter range. The primary issue is that the goal five wildlife inventories in most counties have not been updated since the 1980s. Therefore, ODFW recommends coordinating with local governments to update goal five programs to include the best available data from mule deer habitats, including winter and summer ranges, migration corridors, and stopover areas. ODFW also recommends the adoption of land use ordinances that avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts to mule deer habitat. This includes minimum lot sizes and clustering techniques to reduce habitat fragmentation, wildlife friendly fencing, timing and seasonal restrictions, and compensatory mitigation for unavoidable impacts. These techniques are important to consider 
as well as appropriately citing development actions, which Jeremy will discuss next. Inappropriately decided, inappropriately cited development and associated infrastructure such as roads and fences can result in individual and cumulative impacts to mule deer and their habitat. This can include renewable energy projects, rural developments, and expansion of urban growth boundaries. Proper siting includes early engagement with ODFW, regardless of the siting and permitting process, to provide proactive opportunities on avoiding and minimizing adverse impacts. This photo is an example of appropriately cited development that minimized impacts. It's a solar energy facility within an existing wind energy development footprint on previously disturbed habitat. ODFNW follows the standard mitigation hierarchy, avoid, minimize, and then mitigate. For developments that result in unavoidable impacts to mule deer, ODFNW recommends compensatory mitigation consistent with the ODFNW Fish and Wildlife Habitat Mitigation Policy. As Joy mentioned earlier, ODFNW is not regulatory in any permitting situation where consideration of mule deer impacts would occur. Therefore, we rely on coordination with applicants and their consultants to avoid, minimize, and mitigate in development proposals, as well as with the regulatory entities to adopt the best available mule deer science. Recreation in parts of Oregon serves as a critical part of the local economy. In many cases, impacts to mule deer are not considered as recreational development is not treated with the same concern for wildlife and habitat as other forms of land uses or developments. While ODFMW has the authority to manage wildlife, management of recreation falls to the landowner, leaving ODFW as an advisor outside of our own wildlife management areas. Recognizing that much of the recreation in the state occurs on federal or state lands, ODFNW must work collaboratively with partners to develop strategies for consideration of wildlife and assessment of recreation that currently exists or in any new proposals. Strategies typically employed when advocating for wildlife and recreation conversations can include establishment of best management practices for reducing recreation disturbance, such as timing restrictions or seasonal closures where appropriate. Fully identifying existing recreation infrastructure, such as mapping trails that have already been developed on the landscape that may not be fully accounted for by land managers, helps in assessing not only the impacts that already exist, but also where future infrastructure could be focused to reduce disturbances into new areas. Co-location of any new infrastructure into already disturbed areas can help balance the need for increased recreational opportunity while minimizing the probability of negative effects on wildlife. Finally, delineation of areas that currently have high habitat integrity and establishing protections for those areas can assist in protecting those habitats and maintain the best remaining places on the landscape that have not yet been altered by development. We mentioned recreation infrastructure in the previous slide. One common example that is readily apparent to most, are, of, to most of us are trails and roads. This includes impacts from roads, trail use, and off-highway vehicles such as four-wheelers, side-by-sides, or snowmobiles during sensitive life history periods for mule deer. Human encroachment into mule deer habitat through these corridors can have multiple negative effects that are well documented. One of the most obvious negative effects is from direct highway mortality. Less obvious effects can include introduction of noxious weeds along not only roads but trails, displacement of animals from critical habitats, or even changes in reproductive behavior. ODFNW works closely with our partners to ensure species such as mule deer are properly considered in any proposal for new infrastructure or recreational opportunities. Like any other siting conversation, working relationships with permitting entities and land managers are the key to having species considered in these processes. Shed hunting has grown rapidly in popularity in Oregon and throughout the West over the past few decades. With this growth and participation has come new challenges at maintaining effective winter range for mule deer. Initiating seasonal winter range closures has proven effective and is a strategy that ODFNW has employed on our own wildlife areas and promoted with our federal land management partners. In addition, working on public outreach and education regarding methods to reduce negative impacts associated with shed hunting and the challenges deer face from such disturbances will be key moving into the future. With the ever increasing need for housing throughout the state comes increased likelihood of human expansion into currently occupied deer habitats. In many cases, we have seen deer acclimate to human incursion into their habitats and urbanize. 
This can lead to direct conflicts with humans through property damage from activities such as deer browsing or from vehicle collisions. Feeding of deer within urban landscapes has also led to suspected increases of disease outbreaks as deer unnaturally congregate around urban feeding sites year round. Many communities in Oregon have approached ODFW for ways to reduce urban deer densities or for assistance with ongoing nuisance and conflict scenarios. Reducing the opportunity for these conflicts to develop is a better strategy than trying to alleviate the issues once they occur. Like all draft mule deer chapters, the anthropogenic chapter is available for review on the ODFNW webpage. And as previously mentioned, the QR code on these slides will take you directly to the appropriate site. Joy and I will be available to answer any questions you may have at the end of the other presentations. Next up, we have Yvonne Shaw, who is ODFNW's anti poaching coordinator, and Lieutenant Craig Heiberger from OSP to talk about more along the poaching issue. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvonne Shaw. I am the campaign coordinator for the Protect Oregon's Wildlife Turn in Poachers campaign. I'm here to talk to you about Chapter 11 poaching for the um, mule deer update. And joining me later for the question and answer session will be Lieutenant Craig Heiberger from the Oregon State Police Fish and Wildlife Division. Thank you for being here. In 2019, the Oregon legislature passed legislation to allow an anti-poaching effort. Um, this legislation had bipartisan support across the state and across the aisle, and it was made possible through lobbying efforts and advocacy from groups like Oregon Hunters Association, Defenders of Wildlife, and the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, among many others. One of the drivers of this legislation was a mule deer study completed in 2012. In this mule deer study, as you can see, of the known causes of mortality, 23% of the deaths were attributed to poaching. This surpassed legal hunting, which accounted for 21% of mule deer mortalities. We should expect that poaching rate was actually much higher as most poaching goes undetected. This study was a point of reference in establishing Oregon's anti-poaching effort. In 2019, after support from across the state, the legislature approved $4.4 million to fund an anti-poaching effort. This calls together three agencies to form a team. The team includes an education and awareness campaign housed at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, four additional troopers and one sergeant with OSP Fish and Wildlife Division, and a wildlife anti-poaching resources prosecutor based at the Oregon Department of Justice. The education campaign raises the profile of poaching, poaching across the state and educates Oregonians on how to recognize and report poaching. The additional troopers bring the total of sworn officers across the state to 128. And the special prosecutor will assist in prosecution training techniques and coordinating crimes that happen across jurisdiction lines. The prosecutor can also, upon request, assist in prosecuting wildlife crimes cases. The ODFW Education and Awareness Campaign educates the public on how to recognize and report poaching. Campaign messaging increases awareness of poaching as an issue relevant to all Oregonians and raises the profile of the Turn In Poachers tip line. The Education and Awareness Campaign has a designated community website, invested community partners, a robust digital print and billboard campaign, as well as earned media through more than 80 news releases and 30 community presentations. And here are some of the tools in the OSP Fish and Wildlife Arsenal. Winter Range Enforcement. OSP Fish and Wildlife Division conducts targeted enforcement efforts. Funding pays for high priorities associated with key winter ranges in Eastern Oregon as cooperatively identified by ODFW and OSP Fish and Wildlife Division. Efforts include planned projects such as saturation patrols 
and extended response opportunities to address specific situations as part of ODFW mule deer initiative objectives. OSP Fish and Wildlife joined the nonprofit Oregon Wildlife Foundation to purchase the state's first conservation canine in 2018. Buck, a yellow Labrador retriever, can detect gunshot residue, locate weapons, find people, locate carcasses, follow scent trails, and other objectives that save troopers time and effort. In 2023, the program expanded to include Scout, a black lab mix. Both canines are effective in their jobs in the field and are welcome ambassadors to many community hunting and fishing events. The Wildlife Enforcement Decoy or WED program is a successful tool in the OSP Fish and Wildlife Arsenal. WED patrols are effective in catching and charging violators and saving wildlife. The aviation program has uh, an aviation unit consisting of four aircraft flown by sworn pilots. The aircraft are highly effective in monitoring and tracking animal populations, as well as patrols for spotlighting and other criminal activity. The pilots patrol travel management areas in a relatively small amount of time to detect spotlighting, unauthorized vehicles, and other activities. When pilots spot suspicious activity, they notify troopers patrolling on the ground to investigate. The Special Investigations Unit, OSP Fish and Wildlife, has six sworn members effective in discovering poaching rings and other organized illegal activities. And the Turn in Poachers tip line. The tip line creates a direct reporting mechanism between people who observe or suspect poaching and the troopers able to respond. From there, poaching and habitat destruction calls are routed to the nearest Fish and Wildlife Trooper. The OSP tip line is a longstanding program established by the Oregon Hunters Association as an incentive for people to report suspicious activity or illegal killing of fish and wildlife. The fund paid cash for reports leading to citations or arrests. ODFW later implemented hunter preference points instead of cash. Hunter preference points have quickly gained popularity. The tip line operates under a simple model. Parties that call and report information leading to an arrest or citation can claim either the cash reward or the hunter preference points. The cash rewards and preference points vary according to species. In cases where preference points are chosen as the reward, the number of preference points is based on the species and the number of animals. Preference points may be applied to any legal hunting opportunity. For the mule deer update plan, plan update, we have identified several issues we may work towards to improve outcomes in poaching detection, enforcement, and prosecution. Issue one is metrics tracking. These strategies allow ODFW and its partners to monitor trends in the number and nature of the contacts, which in turn will be important for measuring the overall success of the anti-poaching campaign, particularly in terms of encouraging more people across the state to make use of the tip line. Issue two is measuring impact. Ongoing media and advertising monitoring assures us that we understand how our messaging resonates with the public and where we need to make changes. Issue three, financial and personnel resources. Continuing an earned media campaign and keeping partners updated is central to maintaining issue awareness. When we have community partners who are updated, responsive, and involved, and who have the tools necessary, we can promote the tip line and the importance of reporting crimes. An example of community awareness is when we host fundraising efforts to promote the tip line. Another important strategy is to increase the number of OSP Fish and Wildlife Troopers across the state. Oregon is a large state, and trooper patrols include not only mountains, prairies, and high desert, but inland waterways, marine reserves, and beaches. When we, when we increase the number of troopers, we increase responsiveness, visibility, and availability 
of law enforcement to detect fish and wildlife crimes. Issue number four, lack of case tracking. We lack the process and staff to track cases to determine which cases are adjudicated or to report the end results of case decisions. We need a dedicated staff person who can monitor and track cases through the courts across the state. Ideally, this would be an additional staff member from one of the three partnering agencies. Issue five, it's a niche area of law. Prosecution techniques for wildlife crimes are specialized and rely on coordination among district attorney jurisdictions and law enforcement counterparts. These strategies create opportunities for training and cross-training among prosecutors and law enforcement. Strategy one, use statewide, regional, and emergent events with attendance of local prosecutors as training opportunities for the special prosecutor to educate DAs and DDAs. And strategy two, create joint training opportunities between DA office and local law enforcement. Issue six, cases of wildlife crimes are factually complex. The special prosecutor will work across across jurisdictions to identify at least one deputy district attorney who can specialize in poaching cases. These cases offer unique prosecution challenges that expand DDA's frame of reference and experience. Pairing DDA's with regional law enforcement adds additional opportunities for case coordination. Issue seven, crowded dockets. Because there are not enough practicing attorneys, cases can be pushed back indefinitely or dismissed outright. We can and should foster collaborative relationships to increase understanding of the issues across all spectrums from evidence collection to prosecution. And we can engage community partners as other victim advocacy groups do. In Oregon, 36 counties have 27 judicial, judicial districts. An ideal ratio would be one prosecutor for every 10,000 residents. We have less than half that. Lack of prosecutors and more recently also of defense attorneys creates an economy of scale problem. We should support community partners as advocates of district attorney's offices and in increasing the number of prosecutors. And finally, we have a case that worked as it should through our system. The case of Walter Erickson, a prolific poacher, is an example of how things can go right. OSP Fish and Wildlife received a call on the tip line. The Special Investigation Unit and local troopers compiled evidence to support a robust court case. The special prosecutor, Jay Hall, led the local DA's office through the prosecution, and the outcome is listed here. In what prosecutors described as a crime spree, Erickson took a four by four, four uh, mule deer, among other animals, and pled guilty to 22 charges. Thank you for your attention to this program. And next, I would like to introduce Josh Smith with chapter 12, population monitoring. Thank you. Um, uh, my, name, my name is Josh Smith. I am the Acting Mule Deer Coordinator for ODFW, and I'm going to be talking, wrap up this portion of the webinar on some of our monitoring efforts as it relates to mule deer here in Eastern Oregon, as well as some changing management objective structure we are proposing in these last few chapters. Just briefly, I, I like to move around a lot, so I'm going to actually turn my camera off for my portion of the presentation, but we'll come back on here uh, for, the, uh, for the question and answer session as we wrap up. So many watching this are probably familiar with this map showing Oregon's wildlife management units. <laughs> this map can be found in our game reg books and has represented the basis for monitoring and harvest management of mule deer for many decades, as well as other species. For the most part, though, these represent political boundaries and fails to incorporate animal movements. <clears throat> One of the biggest changes in terms of both monitoring and management objectives about transitioning to a more biologically appropriate scale, what we are calling the herd range scale. 
We discussed the need and process in a previous webinar and have provided the Herd Range Technical Report on the website for those interested in digging in deeper on how and why we're changing to this new scale. But to make this brief, I would just point out that ultimately, herd ranges should represent the year-round range of a population of mule deer. So the animals we as an agency count on winter range apply to the same populations that are being harvested on summer range. From a monitoring perspective, we do have different rotations for different things, but mainly we do collect several things on an annual basis, mainly our herd comp and, and harvest and mandatory reporting. Our herd, herd comp Composition surveys occur in two distinct time periods, um, fall and spring. Our fall herd comp takes place shortly after the harvest season in late fall, early winter, and consists of obtaining buck doe ratios as well as fawn doe ratios. These are primarily done by helicopter, but some ground counts do occur. Our buck doe ratios provide an estimate of the number of bucks available for breeding, as well as those that might be available for following harvest season. <clears throat> And the fondo ratio provides an estimate of the number of fawns that have survived that first six months of life or a metric of reproduction. Spring comp consists of obtaining adult fawn ratios and comparing that to our fall counts to get an idea of overwinter survival or an estimate of recruitment. Harvest and mandatory reporting does allow us to get an estimate of overall hunter success as well as the species and sex of animals taken. We do collect survival data annually, but not in each herd range. We have been collaring deer for several years for things like the herd range analysis, but really beginning in the winter of 2019 and 20, we began um, collaring approximately 50 adult female and 50 six month old mule deer fawns in three different herd ranges to collect annual survival of adults and overwinter survival of fawns. For abundance right now, we collect an abundance estimate in approximately five to six herd ranges annually in order to get each herd range surveyed once every three years. So those are on a three-year rotation. These are conducted via helicopter and are a hybrid approach of sampling, of quadrat sampling and sightability sampling, where the herd range is subdivided into subunits, and those subunits are stratified by deer density, and a random sample of each stratification is flown. Deer are counted in select subunits and a correction factor applied to account for imperfect detection. Recently, we transitioned to using an integrated population model or an IPM to take all this information and provide us with an estimate of abundance, as well as other important metrics related to mule deer population performance. Some of the benefits of using the IPM include the ability to estimate unmeasured demographic parameters, such as survival, <clears throat> weighing each data source based on its variance and ultimately gauging how important that metric is in the model, using prior knowledge to help inform parameter estimates, and this also allows us to estimate population performance, hopefully in the coming years at least, with different hunting regulations or tag structures. Moving on to some of the issues and strategies section. First and foremost, we do have a long history of collecting data at the wildlife management unit scale, but many data sets were not spatially explicit, so they don't necessarily transition to the herd range. We have a much shorter window to view past mule deer population performance at this new scale. Consequently, as we collect more data and continue to tweak the model, our ability to estimate many of these parameters will only improve. Our integrated population model has already highlighted some areas where we might uh, have some data deficiencies, some places that we recognize could benefit from the increased data collection to help inform the model. It does, however, come with a lot of benefits. Um, Mainly using modeled outputs annually for parameter estimates reduces some of the noise associated with sample variation and environmental variation. We know, for instance, in years with higher snowfall, deer tend to congregate, they're easier to count, like this picture at the bottom, versus years when it's milder conditions, such as this top photo, deer tend to be more dispersed, they're harder to count, and that can influence um, the estimates that we are obtaining from our mon monitoring activities. Additionally, Using modeled outputs also allows us a consistent metric of reporting abundance each year, even when site rider or abundance flights do not occur. So right now, we're collecting abundance estimates once every three years and modeling in between those years. What we hope to transition to is using a, our abundance estimates to inform the model, but still use modeled output uh, to calculate abundance on an annual basis. That will give us greater consistency through time not have these drastic swings that we've observed in some years, um, as well as providing greater transparency on how we're reporting our data to the public. For our abundance estimates, 
the detection factor that we use could benefit from accounting for differences in environmental, like snowfall, and habitat characteristics annually, such as is it closed or open forest type. These changes would help improve estimates of abundance and ultimately aid in informing the model. From a HERTCOM perspective, you know, helicopter flights is the predominant way we collect this data, and these do represent a significant risk to our biologists and staff and are expensive. Where possible, we will continue to evaluate how to reduce flight time while still maintaining data integrity standards. Lastly, just overall, wildlife management is a science-based endeavor, and we will continue to evolve our monitoring efforts based on the best available science. If there are more efficient and precise methods that are developed, we will investigate those changes and continue to evolve as the science evolves. Transitioning now over to the management objective portion, um, again, one of the biggest things is, is we are changing this up. We like to establish management objectives at the herd range scale. These are more biologically appropriate and is a, a necessary change. Um, before we get into that, though, I would like to kind of talk about just briefly here, what PMOs should be. They should be tailored to specific spatial and temporal scale. We should be explicit. We're, we're talking about the spatial scale here, obviously, is the herd range. And then the temporal scale, essentially, we're trying to set these at about a 20-year time scale. And, and that needs to be made explicit on, you know, are we focusing on a 5, 10-year, 20, 50-year um, scale for these management objectives? They should also be realistic and attainable. Um, in all honesty, Unrealistic, unattainable management objectives are essentially become useless as they're just, you're never going to attain them no matter what you do. So that can really erode public support for what the agency is doing. And lastly, they, those things should be measurable as well. And one goal that we really had in thinking about our new management objective structure was the ability to prioritize and rank herd ranges based on mule deer population performance. We don't have the resources to be conducting, you know, heavily heavy management actions in all herd ranges on a on an annual basis across uh, Eastern Oregon. So, you know, prioritizing where to implement management activities and prioritize limited resources was something we thought about with this new procedure. So, historically, management objectives have been set at the wildlife management unit scale, and again, we've talked about issues with that. There's more political than biological boundaries. But th some other issues, you know, many of these were set in the 1990s. Although they have been updated in recent times, many of those do still are still carried over from those 1990s management objectives when environmental conditions, climatic conditions uh, were very different. The population of Oregon was a lot different. Uh, there was a lot fewer cars on the road and that sort of thing. Secondly, it also fails to account for population trends. Just having a static number fails to account for these trends in population. And I just want to give a brief example of what I'm talking about here. These two populations, the one on the left has been declining for several years. And while this population on the right actually shows some modest increases over the last several years. So if we just have a static number, theoretically, both of these populations could be at 50% of management objectives, but you know, I would argue the population on the left is actually in worse shape as it continues to decline, whereas the population on the right is, is in better shape. And so the population on the left would actually be of, of more concern um, for me um, if I was looking to implement management actions or wanting to allocate resources for one of these two populations. What we are proposing is a four tiered system that accounts for both population status or abundance, as well as growth rates or lambda. And the first leg of this is population status. So for population tier one, this would indicate a very low population relative to where we would like it to be and where recent evidence indicates there should be heightened concern for that herd range. Herd ranges with populations at or below that level would get this tier one designation. Tier two would then represent anywhere from one to 25% above that. Tier three would be 26 to 50% above, and tier four would be 50% or greater above that number. And really the way we structured and thought about this was that tier four would represent a number that is likely attainable given realistic growth rate parameters we have observed across some herd ranges in recent years, and then carrying that out over the next 20 years. So applying both a spatial and temporal scale to the management objective structure. 
the second leg of this involves <clears throat> looking at growth rates or lambda. And these are, would be evaluated on a five-year period or kind of a moving window. This two would be made up of four tiers. Tier one would represent populations exhibiting medium to large decreases annually over a five-year period. Anywhere from three or greater than, or I should say less than 3% decrease. So minus 3% growth rate or greater than. And to be clear, these are average annual changes and not simply percent changes over a five-year period. So there's a pretty big difference there. Tier two would represent modest decreases to stable, so anywhere from negative two to zero percent. Tier three would be modest increases, anywhere from 0.01 to three percent. And then that tier four category would represent these medium to large increase or anything greater than than three percent increase. How we would use this is we would use apply this to each herd range and use this scoring matrix to then put a ranking on each herd range. So anything in that red would be of high concern based upon a combination of both that population tiers and the growth rate tiers. Anything in the yellow would be medium concern and anything in the green, light green there would be low concern and the dark green is, is the least concern. We do provide the, the population tiers for each of these in the appendix that we recently published on the website, if folks want to go and look at those. I'm not going to have a chance to go through each herd range individually um, tonight, but we do provide some at least some preliminary rankings for each of those herd range in a, in a table in there, but tables are notoriously difficult for a presentation. So I just thought I would go through the one example we do provide um, is from this Beulah Mount here herd range. Uh, again, this this example herd range report is, is provided in that appendix, and we do hope to get the rest of these out in the coming days. But ultimately, we, again, we want to provide one for each herd range, kind of showing where this herd range is spatially in Eastern Oregon, uh, as well as what units, uh, wildlife management units, um, those historically encompass, and then just some general background on this information uh, on that general herd range. Most folks watching this will have a, a knowledge or history at least of their preferred wildlife management unit structure uh, probably been following that for several years and you know changing to this new scale we know the public doesn't have uh, as much of a background so our the idea was to to present this kind of information to give that background information of the, what's been occurring at the herd range scale over the last several years and to do that <clears throat> we've applied some estimates that we've obtained from our integrated population model, um, putting in a, a post-harvest abundance estimate over the last several years. You can see this population has been declining as well as our buck, do, buck, buck ratios, along with that, that management objective and our bonds per female ratio. Also providing growth rates on an annual basis here. And this is a essentially a Lambda. So anything below this one, this is represents 1.0. Anything below that represents the population has been decreasing. Anything above indicates the population has been increasing. And you can see this population over the monitoring time frame has never seen one year above one or never seen an increasing population from one year to the next. And you can also see a pretty big drop off here in 1617. That was a really harsh winter for us. It hit a lot of our Eastern Oregon populations pretty hard. We had some emergency tag reductions then. Um, and although this this line is increasing. I mean, it's, the population has been decreasing every year, but at least decreasing at a lower rate, especially relative to this 2016-17 level. And then applying this population tier, <clears throat> sorry, I should have should have taken these off here for now, but what we can see here is there's a five-year growth rate it is 0.93. So that is a tier one on our growth rate categories. That's been a 7% annual decline. Again, corresponding to tier one on that growth rate. 2022 population is 11,292. That too is also in the tier one category. And again, these estimates are all in the appendix, but that also corresponds to this population tier one. So we come in here and can see for 2022, this gets a, this is the ranking in 2022. It is of high concern. So. One thing that we like about this system is the ability to kind of be more of a gauge to management activities. Given this population is declining for, at 7% annually the last several years, it's unlikely 
that that is going to reach this tier four population tier anytime in the near future. However, if we conduct management activities or, or change some stuff on the landscape, whatever that may be, um, you know, the idea would be that hopefully by 2025 or 2026, we see that this growth rate has actually gone up to the tier three and we're getting, you know, one to 2% annual increase in population. And ultimately that would transition into, uh, hopefully if we are able to maintain that for a couple of years, then that would start ticking up into this tier two population category. <clears throat> so the idea is it just, it, it, again, it's more of a gauge than just a, 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 a yardstick that we stick in the sand and try to gauge um, what's going on in these herd ranges. It's a little bit more prescriptive in that sense. Last thing I want to discuss here is uh, our buck management objectives. Where possible, we've tried to maintain relative consistency with our wildlife management unit structure. The one thing we did do is reduce this from a 12, from four tiers down to three different ratios, I guess. Uh, we removed the 12 bucks per 100 does category and, and just kind of lumped those into 15 bucks per 100 does. From a management perspective, there's not much difference. And this graph here on the right just kind of shows and illustrates um, how that, at least those preliminary estimates and what we're proposing here uh, in this figure, you can see most of those are in the 15 uh, bucks per 100 doe category. There are, I think, four uh, at the 20 bucks per 100 doe and three at the 25 bucks per 100 doe category. I guess the last thing I'd like to leave here and, and make make explicit before we, before we end this webinar uh, here tonight is that our current harvest strategy, as it especially as it relates to bucks anyway, uh, will be mainly driven by our buck MO structure. Uh, the population management objective structure that we've outlined here um, will not really influence uh, our harvest management strategy, at least as it relates to bucks. It will have more of an impact on, on our doe harvest as we start seeing those populations tick up into tiers three and four in the population categories. Maybe we do look at implementing some, some doe harvest in some areas where um, estimates seems like the population could su sustain that. But again, just because a herd range gets a heightened concern category, we are not gonna halt buck harvest in that population. Um, that will be driven by a lot of other factors, but just simply the structure will not dictate uh, turning on or off a buck harvest in a herd range. And with that, I will conclude uh, my section of the talk tonight. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for the great presentations, uh, specifically Joy, Jeremy, Yvonne, Greg, Craig, and Josh. Appreciate you at uh, the time and the effort that you put into those presentations and, and the composing of those draft chapters. We will now venture into our live Q&A session for the night. The mule deer management plan questions of all types are welcome, and we are recording your questions. So I would like to thank you all that have submitted questions leading up to tonight's webinar. Uh, that said, tonight's conversation will be focused on these three chapters. So getting started, I've got a question from the public for Jeremy regarding anthropogenic impacts. So Jeremy, the question is, what can ODFW do about shed hunters spooking mule deer? All right, thanks, Derek. Yeah, you know, I think there's a couple things as an agency we can really focus on as we talk about shed hunters. Uh, first is working with our land management partners, trying to instill some winter range protections, whether that be travel management areas or other winter range closures, um, similar to what ODF and W has done on our own wintering wildlife areas, in closing those areas to provide that habitat security for those mule deer in winter. Um, the other thing we can do is just public outreach. I think a lot of shed hunters don't recognize that their presence during that critical winter period can have a very detrimental effect on mule deer. So getting out and helping to educate our constituents on, on what those challenges are for deer in the winter is really a key to, to reducing that disturbance on deer. So as a follow-up question to that, um, what do you see with the current push for green energy build out also having an impact on deer? 
You know, there's really when we talk about green energy, whether it be wind or solar, there's a lot of different potential disturbances to wildlife that can occur from those. Uh, wind energy, obviously, we've dealt with that in Oregon for quite a few years. Very large projects with a very small footprint, but but a lot of disturbance potentially associated with those if they're not properly sited. Um, solar farms are really kind of a new development in Oregon that we're still working through. But the biggest challenge with solar farms is that they're required by law to completely fence in those facilities. And, and they're a much larger footprint. So when we look at some of the permitted or proposed projects in Oregon, we're talking thousands of acres of footprint that all has to be fenced off. So, you know, there's a lot of work going on by our field staff in working through those proposals to try to minimize those impacts to wildlife. Proper siting is key. We encourage developers to contact us early so we can ensure that we're not siting projects in areas of critical deer habitat, whether that's summer range, winter range, or probably most important migration corridors. So we look at our, some of our new migration corridor data that's come out and, and been published in this upcoming mule deer plan. You know, we recognize that disturbance in those corridors probably can't be mitigated. We cannot replace those, you know, learned traits of moving through that, that corridor. So we work as an agency with the permitting bodies. Again, we're non-regulatory. It's really getting in and advocating for those habitat protections and for projects that are cited, looking at appropriate mitigation uh, to offset the loss of habitat for the deer. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Switching over to Yvonne, I got a question for you. So Yvonne, I mean, we're not in the, the world of law enforcement. Um, a lot of our public doesn't know all the nuances and all the challenges and all the steps that it goes through. Um, could you try to provide a bit of a crash course on what are some of the major challenges getting poachers tried and convicted? Yvonne, I think you might be on mute. Thanks. Sure. And we do have um, a number of challenges that we need to address when we talk about prosecuting these crimes. Um, first of all, they're very nuanced. There are different um, features to collecting evidence and presenting that evidence in court. And so one of the things we're working on is co-training and cross-training district attorneys and local law enforcement to work together and present cases in a way that's more likely to um, win. Um, another challenge we're running into is a lack of prosecutors and more recently, a lack of defense attorneys. And so we ask people to be informed and complain in ways that are helpful to their DA's offices. And that means encouraging people to support their local DAs and to pass um, taxes and legislation that increase their resources so that they're more able to meet all the demands that are appearing on the dockets. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, and another question for you. So we received one comment where the sender said that they've been hunting in Oregon for decades and have never been checked by law enforcement in the field. They want to know, how are we to stop poachers if game wardens are never in the field? Well, we have 128 sworn um, officers. Oregon State Police work as our agency game wardens. We partner with Oregon State Police Fish and Wildlife Division um, for enforcement. And there are a couple of things I would point out in this. One is that we don't have enough troopers out there and people should be checked more often. So. Um, please encourage your legislators and other lobbyists to increase their resources so that they can hire the personnel that we need. Um, and number two, we need the general public to be the eyes and the ears out there. So we've launched this campaign really to educate people on how to recognize poaching, how to report poaching, and then to push out those incentives through our cash rewards and hunter preference points for poaching cases that, um, that are for, for reports that lead to an arrest or a citation. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne, and I and appreciate that call to action because absolutely there's extra eyes and ears out there in the woods that can serve as incredibly valuable uh, to law enforcement and to this greater good. Um, so continuing to pass the mic around the, the room here, I'll go to you, Josh. Um, so we got a question about um, these new management objectives. 
and to better understand what those are and to make this proposed transition from the previous objectives. Um, could you provide kind of that crosswalk of how these new management objectives relate to the previous ones? Yeah, thanks, Derek. Um, well, in a lot of ways, they sort of don't, <laughs> to be quite honest. I mean, we are transitioning from a new scale. So most of our management objectives were set at the wildlife management unit scale. We think that, uh, you know, again, we, we've talked about a lot of issues with setting those at the wildlife management unit scale in the past, but uh, this, this, this new scale kind of takes into account those animals that are that are being harvested and being counted on on winter range and being harvested on the summer range. So we're we're transitioning to a, a completely new scale. So I think that's that's an important distinction, I guess I would say. I mean, clearly there there are some ways to to factor in some of those historic estimates at the wildlife management unit scale. That's a little bit easier, um, quite frankly, for some herd ranges that you know kind of encompass. Uh, multiple wildlife management units that are not being split by a herd range, <clears throat> for instance, like the Northeast section versus some of those in the central Oregon um, coming down through the central blues there that we really, what the data is showing us is there's two or three separate herd ranges coming together in some of these wildlife management units. So we have to take those historic estimates with a, a little bit of grain of salt as we, we transition to this new scale and think about uh, these more biologically meaningful um, way to look at management objectives, I guess. <clears throat> I appreciate that. I know that's going to be a, a topic of conversation quite a bit here moving forward still, just to make sure everybody, people are aware of what those changes are and, and how we're approaching this um, moving forward and using this new information. And, and along those lines, we've received some questions or some comments about, you know, models and how to use information that may not be as clear or as straightforward as say just actual counts or minimum counts that are conducted by staff. Um, so can you explain why like hard numbers from actual counts um, aren't the priority, aren't potentially the best information relative to the use of models and other things that are a little bit more complicated? Yeah, I think I think that's an important distinction that we need to make there. Um, so clearly we've gone through several iterations of, of trying to enumerate deer and other other wildlife species here in Oregon. And um, obviously we're, we're, we're trying to use the best available science we can to help in that process and guide that. We think we've, you know, where we're at currently represents a pretty good system for, for actually counting deer. Um, however, having said that, you know, as I point out, pointed out in the webinar, there are a lot of factors that can influence that. Uh, you get different environmental conditions, make deer harder to count. Um, like say in milder winters, deer are more dispersed, they're, they're more widely distributed. Um, they still tend to be up in, up in the trees and that sort of thing. Whereas you get a really harsh winter, uh, deer tend to congregate a lot more. So there's a lot of sample variation, I guess, that comes when we count these animals and these species. Um, and so using modeled approach kind of takes some of that, hopefully smooth some of that variability out. Um, I guess, you know, kind of related to that too, is the fact that we're not able to enumerate deer in each herd range on an annual basis. So in between those years, we are having to model already, um, to come up with a population estimate. And this is just a way to kind of, to kind of smooth that out and not see these large fluctuations that we tend to get. and quite honestly provide a more realistic assessment on an annual basis of what uh, those populations are actually doing. Yeah, I appreciate that that distinction there, Josh, and that's clearly um, a desire across the board for the agency, whether we're counting sage grouse or mule deer or wolves or what have you, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're factoring in, staff time, staff effort, resources, safety, Limitations, you know, it's crazy how just one snowstorm or lack of snow um, can have such profound impacts on our ability to count organisms. And if we rely on those hard numbers, you're going to see that massive fluctuation. So we need something to fill in the gaps and account for that variability. So um, yeah. we're recognizing a lot of folks are going to need some help to, to better understand that. Just just briefly on that, you know, one, one thing that, you know, probably quite frankly, maybe not 
as great as we should be, but you know, all of our estimates, everything we 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 produce has variability in it, right? Uh, you know, even even those hard numbers, those abundance estimates, a lot of times we we say it's a hard number, but there is confidence intervals associated with that, and uh, and and that's true for all of our our observation data. Our herd comp also has variability. Um, and so the model also actually is has the ability to weigh some of that variability across those and say, hey, this one seems to be the most important parameter. Or we should put more weight on this this year and, and so on and so forth. So um, I do think it, it is important to consider there there is variation across everything that we collect uh, as an agency as it relates to a lot of these population parameters. Thanks, Josh. Um, so again, everybody, uh, this is the live Q&A portion of tonight's presentation. Please feel free to submit questions. We're still receiving those in, and we try to get to them as much as we can in this in this uh, webinar. Um, but we have been receiving a lot of uh, comments for the last weeks and months. Um, and so I've got a question for Joy. Um, and so we've actually received a lot of comments. So I'm going to kind of try to bunch those together into one large comment, being that um, you know a lot of people are observing that disturbances are increasing in Oregon and a lot of places, especially Central Oregon. Uh, in fact, one comment we received said that the Cascade Mountain Range is being loved to death by recreational users, hikers, climbers, YouTubers, skiers, and mountain bikers. Uh, they say that meadows that once held deer are now full of tents from recreational campers. So, Joy, regarding these concerns, what do you think can be done to protect important deer habitats like winter range from human development and activities like those? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so as we discussed during the presentation and within chapter 10, and Jeremy noted, um, you know, ODFW has limited direct management authority over the habitat which mule deer depend. So we really rely on relationships with private landowners, with local governments, federal and state management agencies, and tribal partners to collaborate on measures to protect mule deer and their habitats. And I think collaboration is really the key. Um, this includes working with partners on properly evaluating recreational infrastructure to avoid and minimize impacts, um, as well as implementing habitat restoration and enhancement actions on trails or other impacted areas to increase habitat function. Um, chapter 10 also includes some specific recommendations and strategies on this issue, um, including using the most up-to-date data and land use decisions from mule deer, um, properly citing development um, to avoid and minimize impacts, and also mitigating unavoidable impacts from development. So one strategy to highlight that's also um, explained more in the narrative is the recommendation to update Goal 5 wildlife inventories within local comprehensive plans. Um, many of these have not been updated since the 1980s, so a lot of those decisions are being made on outdated um, habitat data. So in addition to updating these inventories, we recommend adopting land use ordinances and measures that would specifically identify how impacts to mule deer um, habitat is evaluated, and then how would that be evaluated to avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts from development. And this can include habitat protection measures such as minimum lot sizes or clustering developments to really uh, maintain that habitat connectivity. So those are some good strategies for development and being a little bit more proactive. Um, we get a lot of questions though about reactive measures and opportunities to just straight up close areas, close trailheads, close areas to, to access, um, you know, especially in summer range, when that's where you're going to see the, the greater human activity and the potential impact to mule deer. I mean, what are the options there? Are there ways in which ODFW can close things or advocate for others, or is that even really necessary or meaningful in the big scheme of things? Yeah, I think that timing and seasonal restrictions can be an effective tool to avoid and minimize impacts um, to summer range. And I think that, um, you know, being proactive on proposing management strategies from new development proposals is typically easier than trying to remedy impacts from existing developments. Um, but definitely um, trail and habitat or trail closures can be um, a tool that could be utilized. Okay, and recognize too, I mean, that's that's not the easiest thing to do, right? And so a lot of us are still using those, those trails just the same. Um, okay. And so there's gonna be a necessary process to to, to get those things implemented where necessary, making sure that the whole public is aware of why versus knee-jerk reactions. So recognize that's not an overnight type of activity. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Joy. Um, so I'm gonna keep throwing some questions out there. I got another one for Yvonne. Um, so 
this report from the survey on Oregonians' attitudes about poaching, um, is that available? Is that something that the public can access or at the uh, contact go to directly? Where can we find that? Sure, you'll be able to find that um, in our campaign materials. We'll post that on our website soon so people can locate that. But um, the, the takeaway from that is that we surveyed Oregonians across the state to find their opinions on poaching. And we use that information from that survey um, to, to develop all of our messaging, all of our focus groups, everything. So we're leading a well-informed campaign um, that we hope will reduce poaching by increasing reporting. Great, thanks. Um, and I appreciate that, that that survey was done because that's always priceless to really genuinely know what our public thinks and wants and what's the kind of, to be honest with you, some of the low hanging fruit where we think that the public might be more, most excited to engage um, and definitely help, you know, because this is, affects all Oregonians. It's the hall of hands on deck um, on that topic. Um, so question for Jeremy. We got a comment from a, a hunter that said that um, one year they've they've historically visited over and over again, uh, good experience with high harvest success and a large number of bucks over the last years. Um, but last year they and their their hunting partner had a tag, but they didn't see anything to harvest. Um, however, what they did see and hear were a lot of ATVs. Uh, assuming probably four four wheelers and side by sides, and so they're really concerned about not only ATV use during the hunting season, but also just year round. I mean, those suckers are loud and and pretty awesome. They're fun vehicles; and they can take you anywhere. But you know, some of those unintended consequences are on the the minds of a lot of our hunters and mule deer enthusiasts. So, you know, what's recommended is this something that can be stopped, should be stopped, especially on the the mule deer front. You know, there's a couple different ways to look at that issue, Derek. You know, I think throughout the state, we've seen a, a general increase in recreational use from off-highway vehicles. Um, a couple different approaches have been taken by various districts throughout the state to, to try to address that. One is working with our federal land partners at travel management areas. You know, there's a lot of areas in the state where we've designated portions of forest roads or areas close to all vehicular use, including OHVs during specific times of the year, whether that's for winter range protection or to create security habitat during the hunting season. There's a lot of areas in the Blue Mountains where we've created those travel management areas specifically for the hunting period to try to give that security habitat that animals need and provide a hunting experience for those trying to get away from ATVs. Um, you know, I think this is another area similar to shed hunting where just straight education can be a benefit trying to help people recognize what those impacts are to all vehicular use. Um, you know, we point to, at a couple different points in the mule deer plan, we point to Starkey data that shows what that incursion of, you know, different wheeled vehicles can do to disturb animals and move them off the landscape. So really what we need to do is, is continue to work on that public outreach, work with the constituents, as well as look at those areas where we're starting to see increased impacts on animals, and partner with whatever the land management agency is, state, federal, private, to try to look at limitations to use from those vehicles on those particular landscapes. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so go back to you, Josh. Um, so getting into some of the weeds of these uh, objectives, these proposed objectives for mule deer monitoring, we received a question about the combined population size of mule deer in tier four is fewer deer than current management objectives. So the question of concern is that why is ODFW lowering the number of deer that are desired on the landscape? Uh, isn't this just lowering the bar to increase the odds of success? I guess I would frame this a little bit differently than Lowering the bar, I, I think it's setting more realistic and attainable goals, as kind of pointed out in the webinar. Uh, if you look at our current MO structure right now uh, and, and tally those up across all of our wildlife management units, I think we're at 340 some thousand deer, which is about essentially doubling the population of mule deer we're estimating right now. Um, and realistically, 
we're not going to get there at least in in the near future i it, it just seems like an unrealistic goal to attain over over the relatively you know next 15 to 20 years um so i think setting these as a as a more realistic goal helps us to gauge progress um i would say that you know if you tally up the current tier four and, and again these are a little bit preliminary we're still tweaking some of the models but i believe that represents about a 44 percent increase from where we are currently and uh, you know in given some of these trends in our populations that are declining um i would argue that a 44% increase over the next 20 years would be a, a, a pretty big improvement uh, to our mildew populations overall in Eastern Oregon. So I guess, you know, kind of a, a long-winded answer to a, a, to a question there, but uh, that's, that's how I would frame it uh, related to that, that question. Okay. Well, I'm sure that's going to be a topic that comes up over and over again, you know, because we're talking about changing the, these objectives. Um, so it's good that we're having these conversations now as we continue to have them to make sure we can try to describe it every way possible so everybody feels comfortable um, with what's being proposed and what may proceed. Um, so Josh, another question for you, one that just came in. Uh, the question is that, um, is it factually accurate to say that mule deer have been on the decline across many Western states? Uh, this person says that their research and experience say the answer is yes. Um, so they say, if that's true, could it be included in the public information outreach to dispel the belief that this is a problem specific to Oregon and ODFW? Yes, that that is a factual statement. Uh, mule deer populations have been declining in a, in, in, in a lot of Western states. Um, in fact, I believe uh, Wyoming was either just did or was recommending to lower a lot of their management recommendations, their management objectives, because um, they recognize where, where they're at um, too. And, you know, I, we've, we've highlighted this in numerous other chapters, but, you know, I, I would point out, we get a lot of comments about hound hunting and that sort of thing. And if we don't have it here and they have it in other states and their populations are doing better, but in fact, mule deer populations are declining across a lot of Western states, and that spans a lot of different hunting techniques for, for cougars and, and other species. Um, so there's there's a lot of nuance going on, but you know, and I, I know it seems like the easy answer would be to blame this all on predators, but you know, one thing that, that has clearly happened, and, and we've got very good data from Eastern Oregon documenting this, is we're, we have gotten warmer and drier and that has had some big impacts on our habitat and the growing season of a lot of our plants that mule deer depend on. Um, there's been a lot of other changes, as I mentioned in the in the talk, growing organ population. That certainly there's there's things that 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 are influencing our mule deer population. From that we also have invasive species coming in. We've had changes in in you know. Uh, Harvest management of our, uh, you know, the timber industry has changed a lot since the 80s, 70s, 90s uh, here in Eastern Oregon, and those two have impacts. It's, you know, it's it's almost death by a thousand cuts as it relates to mule deer. So there's a lot of different aspects to consider. It's a complex issue. If it was a silver bullet, all all of us would have would have figured it out by now. Um, so again, it 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 is an, uh, it is a a, a range wide issue that's going on with mule deer right now. It's not just uh, an Oregon problem. Okay, uh, I think maybe we've got one last question, unless something else comes in over the wire and still keep bugging you, Josh. So we got a, a couple comments today and tonight. Uh, one of them asked, um, how does a scientific-based agency utilizing the North American model of wildlife conservation navigate obstacles like litigation and or political interference. Um, they're specifically concerned about the social and political influences on predator management. Yeah, I think that, that that's actually a really, really, really good question. Um, I think there's definitely several ways to think about this, but uh, from from the, the the political perspective, you know, at least as it relates to to the use of hounds, and I I know again we get we get a lot of comments about bring back 
bring back hound hunting for cougar and bear and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, in all honesty, the, the, the constituents of Oregon have voted on this. Um, this has been up for repeal twice, in fact, and has also been voted on. And that is the current political, um, you know, jurisdiction that we're, we're, we have. And in response to that, though, you know, that obviously is a tool to manage some of those predator populations. But in response to that, we have, been, we have done what we can. We have liberalized a lot of our cougar seasons have been liberalized. We've liberalized our bear seasons. Um, uh, coyotes are, you know, you can harvest those. Uh, they're a, a non-protected species here. Those can be harvested year round. Um, so you just have to work within the confines that you're given, I guess, would be my my kind of my short answer. And uh, I'm not I'm not taking a stance on pro or con helm hunting or whatever. But in all honesty, that's just. We have to manage wildlife under that under that. Uh, with that ban in place, and that is come from the the, the voters of Oregon, and uh, we will abide by that. Um, I just, you know, the, the wildlife model allows us, you know, basically these resources are the state's resources and the, the people of Oregon represent the state, quite frankly, and um, that that is what we have to deal with. So, but I, I will say at times it does make things, it, it does make things challenging to, to implement some things. So, but uh, you, you have to do the best you can with, with the, the guys you're given. All right, thanks, Josh. Well, uh, looking at our list, I'm not seeing any new questions in, so I think we'll just wrap it for the evening. Um, again, thank you very much, staff, and for everybody that's been watching. We genuinely value your participation in this effort to update the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan and look forward to additional engagement. As stated earlier, questions and comments are welcome at any point throughout this lengthy process and can be submitted via the link in the YouTube description below. So the next steps of the mule deer plan, because again, this is the last scheduled webinar, uh, will consist of continued editing of draft chapters and compiling them into a draft plan, complete with references and appendices. This means that the window is still very much open for you to provide comments and help us with edits. If you haven't done so already, we recommend you sign up for email updates as we will use those in our traditional communication outlets to let everyone know when new draft content is available on our website. So stay tuned for updates and thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night.